A very good evening, uh, students. Uh, I have brought the fluoroquinolones uh, today for you as part of our uh, chapters on antimicrobial learning. We have finished the general principles part one. We have also finished the sulfonamides and the combination of sulfonamide with trimethoprim. The drug is uh, 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 cotrimoxazole. And now we are on our way to learn about fluoroquinolones. Students have divided fluoroquinolones into two parts, part one and part two. Part two will uh, deal basically with the type of antimicrobial agents fluoroquinolones are. It will also deal with the mechanism action of the fluoroquinolones and uh, it will also deal with the antibacterial spectrum. The adverse effects of fluoroquinolones, the uses of fluoroquinolones, the drug-drug interactions with fluoroquinolones students will be doing soon in part two. But for now, we have to do part one. Students, as you know that the lockdown is likely to be extended and all you have to do is be in your house and be comfortable to read. Right now, do not bother about your exams. Do not bother for the terms wasted because if we think on these things, then we will get demotivated. This has happened for the first time across the globe and definitely whatever are the missed days, you will definitely be given those days in your semester. So do not worry at all. But yes, no time of a student, especially a medical student, needs to be wasted. And you as students have the responsibility of uh, learning. And how can one learn better? Uh, one cannot learn better than uh, being in the house. So students, maintain a healthy lifestyle, a healthy diet, good sleep hygiene, that means sleep at the proper time, get up at a proper time, and use the right social interaction. Till now we have been criticizing the use of the internet so, so much for communication. But at this point of time, we should refrain from all physical contacts with our dear friends Everything else can wait and you can connect with them through video calling, through social medias like Facebook and Twitter. So do this at a time when you have spent the day well in studies. So let us begin students with fluoroquinolones. So let us have a look at uh, these drugs and these names will be uh, not so familiar to you at this point of time, but uh, gradually you'll become very familiar. We'll start with the quinolon which we have, the only quinolon presently which we have is nalidixic acid. Norfloxacin, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, gatifloxacin, moxifloxacin are also quinolones. But you see a fluorine substitution in them, so they become fluoroquinolones. So advantage of the fluoroquinolones or the quinolones is that fluorination imparts most, more potency to the chemical molecule. Fluorination imparts more passage across the tissues. Fluorination imparts more potency. So fluorination of the quinolones, when they, they were done, they became the fluoroquinolones. Out of the fluoroquinolones, we have norfloxacin, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, and many others. Gatifloxacin and moxifloxacin are relatively newer fluoroquinolones, and their spectrum is little different than the conventional fluoroquinolones. The conventional fluoroquinolone, the prototype antimicrobial agent students, is ciprofloxacin. You might have heard of this drug that it is given for diarrhea, it is given for typhoid. You are right. Ciprofloxacin and fluoroquinolones are considered the drugs of first choice for the treatment of typhoid. And these fluoroquinolones, mind you, are not antibiotics in the truest sense. They are antimicrobial agents with a wide spectrum of action. But yes, they are not antibiotics because they are synthetic in origin. They are not derived from any soil fungus or any other microorganism. So in the strictest sense, they are not 
antibiotics. In that way, they are similar to the sulfonamides because sulfonamides, what is the origin, students? It is from the prontosildi, which contains the active ingredient sulfonilamide, and they are also synthetic. So these drugs are synthetic in nature, and uh, yes, they are very, very uh, effective. They are very potent in suppressing the uh, growth as well as they cause bactericidal action. I told you that antimicrobial can be divided into bactericidal as well as bactericidal. So these drugs are bactericidal in nature. So that is about the fluoroquinolones and uh, yes, the, these drugs are also very useful in the management of tuberculosis. They are used as second line agents in multiple drug resistant tuberculosis. So more of that we will do in the uses, but let us go first with the fluoroquinolones. So this is an example of a quinolone moiety. The quinolone moiety is shown in orange here, and you can see the fluorine substitution here, which makes it a fluoroquinolone. Ciprofloxacin, students, is the prototype drug of the quinolone category. But everything, you know, was not rosy or not is rosy for fluoroquinolones. In the 80s, I told you the first generation fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin, norfloxacin, they were, they began to be used. In the 90s, we had fluoroquinolones with double fluorine substitution. They were uh, moxifloxacin, levofloxacin, gatifloxacin, trovafloxacin. They were introduced over a period from 1990 to 2010. But with fluoroquinolones, there were some fluoroquinolones which were launched, but they had to be taken off the market because of the association of a rare side effect. So this side effect, these fluoroquinolones are no longer available uh, in the market. But yes, you can be asked about the reason why they were withdrawn or why their use is with caution. Fluoroquinolones, uh, they cause this rare side effect, which uh, could not be accepted by the scientific world. So just uh, prior to that, let's, uh, let us read about nalidixic acid first. It is the only quinolone available, and uh, it has less potency than the fluoroquinolones. Probably it is not having a fluorine substitution. It attained high concentrations in the urine, so it was used for the treatment of urinary tract infection. For no other infection, it did receive or it did achieve systemic antibacterial levels. Then we had the fluorinated derivatives. I was talking about ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, ofloxacin, sparfloxacin. Everything ends with the suffix floxacin. The fluorinated derivatives had added antibacterial activity. They had even the gram-positive coverage, coverage for uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, coverage for MAC infections, coverage for legiona infections, coverage for chlamydial infections, coverage for mycoplasma infections. So they had improved better antibacterial activity. And they could cross the tissue barriers because of the fluorination part, so they could achieve bactericidal levels in blood as well as tissues. The bone tissue, you know, where the drugs reach, every antimicrobial cannot reach inside the bone. That is why we have to go for local drug deliveries inside the bone for eradication of bone infection, a condition which is called chronic osteomyelitis. So fluoroquinolones are given for the treatment of eradication of infections in the bones also because it attains high concentration in that tissue also. So they are widely used students. They can be given for typhoid fever. Uh, they can be given for bone infections. They can be given for tuberculosis. They can be given for infections caused by E. coli. Uh, which are uh, uncomplicated urinary tract infections. It can be given for traveler's diarrhea. They have multiple uses. And they would be used, they would be prescribed quite often. Not because they have a very good antibacterial spectrum or they are broad spectrum in nature. They are also relatively safer as compared to other antibiotics. When I compare them with other antimicrobials, I am talking about sulfonamides. You have read about the sulfonamides. The sulfonamides are linked to dangerous skin reactions. Anybody having a sulfa allergy cannot be given the sulfa drug again. It is linked to bone marrow depression, 
abnormalities of the bone elements, the sulfur group of drugs. Cural lawns are not fraught with such problems. Of course, they have their own side effects, but they are not fraught with problems of dangerous skin reactions or something like that. The other advantage of the quinolones are, or the fluoroquinolones for that matter, are that, uh, uh, that uh, they are useful in a wide variety of infections. Uh, I want to tell you that uh, you know, the resistance develops very late to the fluoroquinolones or is difficult to develop. And uh, yeah, there is less microbial resistance seen for fluoroquinolones. Maybe they have a unique target of action. The fluoroquinolones, they do not target the cell membrane students, they don't target the cell wall, neither they target the protein uh, synthesis assembly of the antimicrobials uh, uh, of the microbes, no, neither do they target the folic acid synthesis of the bacteria which sulfonamides were doing. What they target is an important enzyme which is important for DNA strand separation and DNA replication is DNA gyrase. So this DNA gyrase is not present in bacteria and a similar isoform that is topoisomerase is present in the mammalian cells also. So let us go further. Let us first discuss why fluoroquinolones are useful or why they form part and parcel of many prescriptions uh, which we get uh, in our routine day-to-day -day daily uh, practice. They have a broad antimicrobial activity. They are broad spectrum. They are not narrow spectrum like uh, penicillins. They are not narrow spectrum like erythromycin. They are not narrow spectrum like aminoglycosides. They have broad spectrum. So you should have a broad heart, a big heart. So they are also having a broad antimicrobial activity. Another part with the fluoroquinolones are they, are they are effective after oral administration and you know how much is their bioavailability? Sometimes students have difficulty in remembering drugs with 100% bioavailability. Fluoroquinolones are one such drugs with 100% oral bioavailability. Any other drug you know with 100% oral bioavailability? The answer is clonidine which is a drug which is used for lowering the blood pressure. Any other antimicrobial you know which has 100% bioavailability? The answer is doxycycline, which belongs to the tetracycline class. So students, start enlisting the drugs, you know, which you feel have a good oral bioavailability or a very, very good oral, very superior oral bioavailability. And the answer which comes to our mind is fluoroquinolones. Ofloxacin from fluoroquinolones, they say, has a highest oral bioavailability greater than 95%. High concentrations of fluoroquinolones are achieved in target tissues because I told you they can cross the tissue barriers and they have a very long post-antibiotic effect. What is a post-antibiotic effect? More so we will learn when we do the aminoglycosides, but for this point of time, we should know what are the post-antibiotic effects. A post-antibiotic effect will be there with any antimicrobial agent. The question is whether it is long or short. Most of the antimicrobials have a short post-antibiotic effect. Fluoroquinolones and aminoglycosides have long post-antibiotic effect. Now students, what is this post-antibiotic effect? You know that antimicrobials have to reach a minimal inhibitory concentration in the body which corresponds to the mi minimum effective concentration. You know when you are reading about the drugs, the pharmacokinetics of the drug, uh, there is one concentration which is called minimal effective concentration which produces an effect in 50% of the recipients. Similarly, for bacteria, when we measure the antimicrobial effect, we say we uh, take into account not the minimal effective concentration, but the minimal inhibitory concentration. So if the drug levels which you are giving, the antimicrobial which you are administering to the patient, it goes above the MIC, which is the minimal inhibitory concentration, you will get a bacterial Cidal action, bactericidal action which you will be getting and the moment the uh, drug concentrations because of metabolism fall below the MIC, you would stop having the bacterial killing and it is the time for the next dose. Now with the post-antibiotic effect, what they say that even if the drug levels have fallen below the minimal inhibitory concentration for that bacteria, there is going to be a bactericidal action which is going to continue. 
and furocunilans it is going to continue for long so if the drug has a long post antibiotic effect you can give it less times a day you can give it less frequently and that is what the furocunilans are administered on most of them are administered either once or twice a day they have few side effects and yes they have their own share of side effects uh, there is no drug or no class of drug students which doesn't have side effects and this dates back to the previous century for parcelis he used to say that all drugs are poisons the dose decides what is not a poison so these are called the dose related effects of the drugs and yeah all the antimicrobial agents they have their set of side effects yes but they the fluoroquinolones do not have life threatening side effects they do not have life threatening skin reactions they do not have life threatening allergies which a person of uh, taking beta lactam can experience they do not cause any major organ toxicity you know aminoglycosides can cause a uh, vestibulocochlear toxicity or nephrotoxicity for that matter so these drugs they do not cause such toxicity also and the last and the important point is that the microbial resistance to their action does not develop rapidly and you know the resistance doesn't develop to these drugs rapidly they have a low propensity to select plasmid type resistant mutants you know that plasmids are extra chromosomal elements and most of the time the resistance gene is carried by the plasmid and it gets transferred from one bacteria to the other by the plasmid so this plasmid mediated transfer is also less with the fluoroquinolones now i will telling you about the fluoroquinolones which were withdrawn which were launched with lot of pomp and show but they had fatal but rare rare but fatal side effects and that led to the withdrawal of these group of drugs the first in line was timofloxacin which was associated with immune hemolytic anemia had to be withdrawn trovofloxacin associated with hepatotoxicity just recently withdrawn grapofloxacin associated with cardiotoxicity in the form of qtc qt corrected interval qtc interval prolongation clinofloxacin associated with phototoxicity gatifloxacin associated with hypoglycemia because gatifloxacin could stimulate uh, uh it inhibits actually the insulin release it can cause both hyperglycemia as well as hypoglycemia because gatifloxacin might inhibit the metabolism of uh, uh, the sugar lowering agents so if their metabolism is inhibited then their stay in the body gets prolonged and uh, these hypoglycemic agents would lead to hypoglycemia looking into all these side effects these were the drugs which were taken off the market and uh, i would say they are no longer available in all these cases the side effects were not very frequent they were infrequent so as to be missed by pre release clinical trials you know clinical trials are done on a very few set of patients and uh, the rare side effects the less than 0.1% uh, side effects may be missed in uh, such studies even larger incidence of side effects may be missed and uh, that is the role of the post marketing surveillance that uh, the rare side effects can be detected by post marketing surveillance and uh, yeah because they can be detected because they are used in a larger population and even the rarest side effects would come into account and it would be reported so students these are the fluoroquinolones which have been withdrawn and uh, that is the that can be asked to you as an mcq the reason for their withdrawal they are no longer used actually now now coming to the mechanism of action of the fluoroquinolones they have a wonderful unique mechanism of action they inhibit the enzyme which is called dna kinase and this enzyme has important functions to serve in the bacteria this dna kinase enzyme is bound by the fluoroquinolones actually let us first understand what is the use of this enzyme in the dna in the bacterial cell as you know that uh, the dna has to replicate and for that you know the dna is uh, a, a, a double stranded structure and uh, the strands have to separate for replication and uh, replication to occur so strand separation is not an easy job it requires the presence of the enzyme dna kinase and uh, uh, it, uh, that dna kinase is going to prevent excessive positive supercoiling which will happen at the point of separation of the dna the dna kinase is going to introduce a negative supercoils inside and that is the reason the D, the the, the our dna strands are going to separate out and they would be preparing themselves for the uh, dna replication so if dna kinase enzyme is inhibited or its function is interfered with by the fluoroquinolones the bacterial will stop replicating and there will be a time which will come that it will start dying 
No wonder the fluoroquinolones are not bacteriostatic in nature. They are bactericidal in nature. They are broad spectrum and they are bactericidal in nature. Students, you must remember this. So coming to the mechanism of action, let us have it. They are the target bacterial DNA gyrase, which is the enzyme which uh, participates in DNA strand separation and replication, is uh, in gram-negative bacteria, it is called DNA gyrase. And in the gram-positive bacteria, the same enzyme is topoisomerase. Now, the antimicrobial agent doesn't have any problem to enter the bacteria. It enters the bacterium by passive diffusion through the water-filled protein or porin channels in the outer membrane. And you know, if the bacteria have become resistant to the fluoroquinolones, these channels only will not allow the antimicrobial agent fluoroquinolone to get in. So if the fluoroquinolone cannot get in, neither can it uh, reach the DNA gyrase or neither can it inhibit it. So this is one of the mechanisms for resistant bacteria that would not allow the diffusion of the antimicrobial agent, which it was allowing prior. Once inside the cell, they inhibit the replication of the bacterial DNA by inhibiting DNA gyrase. In gram-positive bacteria like Staph aureus, topoisoporase 4 is the primary target. And in the gram-negative bacteria like E. coli, the DNA gyrase, topoisomerase 2, is the primary target. Students. So what is a topoisomerase? As the name suggests, these are enzymes that change the configuration of DNA by nicking the DNA strand, having a pass-through where a segment is passed through inside, and then resealing it. They do not change the DNA's primary sequence. Uh, so let us have a schematic diagram left of the double helix and write the double helix in a supercoiled form. The DNA gyrase unwinds the RNA-induced positive supercoil and not shown, and that is not shown and introduces a negative supercoil. So this is the function of the DNA gyrase and uh, uh, what is not shown is actually its function is not shown here that uh, DNA gyrase unwinds the RNA induced positive supercoiling but yes uh, the supercoiling is shown here how the super negative supercoils are inserted that is not shown here but when the DNA strands try to separate from each other there is excessive positive supercoiling and DNA gyrase comes to rescue of the strands here by introducing negative supercoils and that brings about the replication process easier. Imagine a spring, you know, which uh, is trying to separate out and uh, two springs separating out. So they are going to excessively have a sup positive supercoiling. So that will make the separation even further difficult. So that is what is done by the DNA gyrase. It helps by to, for the strands to separate out by introducing a negative supercoil. So this is how they introduce the negative supercoil. You can see here on the double-stranded DNA, the DNA gyrase site and the segment in the back is sealed. The segment is then resealed from front. So that removes the excessive positive supercoil and that is what we call insertion of a negative supercoil in the DNA. You can also see the fluoroquinolone binding site on the DNA gyrase. So individual strands of double helical DNA have to be separated to permit DNA replication or transcription students. Anything that separates the strands results in overwinding or excessive positive supercoiling of the DNA in front of the point of separation. So to combat this me mechanical obstacle, the DNA gyrase becomes very helpful and is responsible for the continuous production of negative supercoils into the DNA. This is an ATP-dependent reaction requiring that both strands of the DNA be cut to permit passage of the segment of DNA through the break and then the break is resealed from the front. So these are all the ways, uh, they, uh, nobody has seen it actually, it's just a pictorial depiction how the negative supercoiling is inserted and how uh, the re reseal break is on the front side and the back, the back segment is broken but the resealing is from the front side. So that is how the negative uh, supercoils are inserted.
As far as the resistance to the fluoroquinolones are concerned, it is by mutation of the DNA gyrase that is the main mechanism of resistance or could, there could be change in the permeability of the membrane. I told you that uh, the resistant bacteria might not allow the fluoroquinolones to get inside and even if they have got inside, there is an active efflux pump which is developed in the resistance bacteria by Staphylococcus pseudomonal enterococcal resistance to fluoroquinolones. Even if the fluoroquinolone can get in with so much of difficulty, these efflux pumps are there and they throw out the fluoroquinolones. So as a result, fluoroquinolone cannot reach its bacterial target, the bacterial DNA gyrase. Coming to the antimicrobial spectrum of fluoroquinolones, and I told you they have a broad uh, spectrum, and they have lot many uses also. But yes, they have a spectrum, every antibiotic, or if you are reading about the antibiotic, you will have some bacteria against which it is susceptible, but it may not be used for that bacterial infection. So students, you just don't have to be generalizing you used for gram positive infections, used for gram negative infections. No, you have to mention the infection with the causative organism. That way it will help you in two ways. You will be able to remember the uses. You will be able to remember the organism which causes that particular infection and you would be getting better marks also. So remember the infections with the most causative organisms. So if you remember like that, then you will be able to remember the uh, uses of particular antimicrobials. And if you remember the organism, you will remember the antimicrobial uh, spectrum also. So let us go further. They are sidle in nature, broad spectrum in nature. And like aminoglycosides, uh, they have a lot of features which are common with aminoglycosides, except that aminoglycosides are narrow spectrum, but fluoroquinolones are broad spectrum. Aminoglycosides and fluoroquinolones both have uh, long post-antibiotic effect, as we were discussing. And uh, aminoglycosides and fluoroquinolones also exhibit concentration-dependent bacterial killing. I'll deal about this when we talk about the aminoglycosides, but concentration-dependent killing means more the concentration of the antimicrobial in the blood, more would be the killing action. So that is what the fluoroquinolones can be given once a day because they have concentration dependent killing. We can give one single dose in the morning and they have a long post antibiotic effect also. So that would take care even if the drug levels have fallen below the MIC. The fluoroquinolones, uh, especially the ones which came in the 1980s, ciprofloxacin, ofloxacin, they were very effective for gram negative organisms. E. coli, which causes urinary tract infection, uh, lower urinary tract infections like cystitis, upper urinary tract infections like pyelonephritis, complicated urinary tract infections, which are meant, caused by E. coli. So these drugs are effective, very effective for E. coli. Also, they are effective for salmonella, a bacteria which causes, uh, gram-negative bacteria, which causes typhoid fever. And furoquinolones, you know, are the drugs of choice for the treatment of typhoid fever. They are also effective against pseudomonas, but furoquinolones don't have a status of being drugs of choice for pseudomonas because for pseudomonas, we have other antimicrobials in the form of aminoglycosides or anti-pseudomonal penicillins which are going to do the job. Of course, ciprofloxacin is effective for pseudomonas. It may be one of the most, uh, it may be one of the fluoroquinolones which is most effective for pseudomonas, but yet still it is not utilized for pseudomonal infections because yes, we have better antimicrobial agents which uh, inhibit the pseudomonas at lower concentrations, so better use them. But yes, spectrum, if you consider pseudomonal spectrum, anti-pseudomonal spectrum is there for fluoroquinolones. The fluoroquinolones can go inside the cell and they do uh, eradicate or do kill the intracellular pathogens. These are the Legionella species, which causes Legionnaise pneumonia. Legionella, Legionnaise disease or Legionnaise pneumonia, the drug of choice students is a macrolide azithromycin. But yes, these drugs can also be given. Some intracellular pathogens like mycobacterium, including mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacterium avium complex, a drug which causes atypical, which is called an atypical mycobacteria, they are responsive to fluoroquinolones. So much so that moxifloxacin to date is advocated as one of the most superior antimicrobial agents for drug resistant tuberculosis. Fluoroquinolones are also effective for mycobacterium leprae infections, which causes leprosy. 
they do have good activity for the gram positive organisms staphylococcus where unfortunately they are not used for staphylococcal infections and they are not used for the notorious variant of staphylococci the name of the drug is methicillin resistant staph aureus almost all the antimicrobials are resistant to this mrsa and with bacterial resistance becoming very very common uh, this mrsa species is now considered a nosocomial pathogen Continuing with the antimicrobial uh, spectrum, they are effective with the treatment of the sexually transmitted disease gonorrhea, and where a single dose of fluoroquinolones may be effective, but they are not effective for treponema pallidum, which causes syphilis. For syphilis, you have to give penicillins, which become the drug of choice, and if the patient is allergic to penicillin, we have to give tetracyclines. But fluoroquinolones do not have any activity against syphilis. Yes, they have good activity for the treatment of gonorrhea. They also have good activity against other organisms which can cause sexual transmitted diseases like uh, huntington dukri and chlamydia trachomatis they do have activity against huntington dukri and chlamydia trachomatis though the newer agents which i was talking about the recent fluoroquinolones levofloxacin and moxifloxacin they have a good activity against gram positive organisms like streptococcus pneumoniae and they also have good activity against anaerobes so they are actually called students the respiratory fluoroquinolones and they can be used for community acquired pneumonia for tuberculosis and many any other such respiratory indications which we will be doing in the uses very soon now coming to the classification of the fluoroquinolones we had the earlier fluoroquinolones which came in picture in the 1980s with one fluorine substitution they were norfloxacin ciprofloxacin ofloxacin and pefloxacin everything ends here with fluxacin students and these fluxacins had good activity against the gram negative they were having major coverage for gram negative organisms staph was sensitive but less and uh, yes they did have a uh, coverage for uh, mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis also to some extent so this is the first generation they had more gram negative coverage but as the uh, time passed by in the 1990s and the 2000s we came up with the second generation uh, fluoroquinolones levofloxacin moxifloxacin gemifloxacin Plurifloxacin, lomifloxacin, and sparfloxacin. These are some of the fluoroquinolones which are belonging to the second generation. And these second generation fluoroquinolones had greater activity for gram negative in comparison to the first generation. Over and above, it had extended antibacterial spectrum that it could take care of the chlamydia, which causes sexually transmitted disease, and pelvic inflammatory diseases. It could take care of mycoplasma, which causes pneumonia. It could take care of legionna, which causes legionnaire's disease. So, all said and done, it had a broadened, broadened antibacterial spectrum. Yes, they did have activity against the gram-positive organisms also. So these are the bacteria just to take out few. E. coli which causes urinary tract infection, Salmonella which causes typhoid, Shigella which causes dysentery, Compilobacter jejuni which also causes uh, similar to something like a diarrhea, Neisseria gonorrhea which causes sexually transmitted diseases, Proteus which, which is an opportunistic uh, nasocomial pathogen which can cause uh, catheter related urinary tract infections. But yes for Proteus also fluoroquinolones are not the drug of choice. For Proteus, uh, Sclapsiella and Pseudomonas we have to resort to something even more potent and those are the bactericidal protein synthesis inhibitors amino glycosides again i am telling that they do have action against pseudomonas but they are not useful for the treatment they are not used for treatment of pseudomonal infections and they do have activity against staph aureus but not against the mrsa now we come to the fewer newest fluoroquinolones who have joined the bandwagon and they have activity against gram positive organisms like streptococcus pneumoniae some staphylococci and they also have good anaerobic activity so these are the new fluoroquinolones which have come in moxifloxacin uh, is available with us gadifloxacin has recently been withdrawn because it caused blood sugar disturbances and qtc interval prolongation now coming students to the pharmacokinetics of the drug, they are very well absorbed. Their oral viability students is very, very high. For ofloxacin, they say it ranges almost 100%. So, you know, you should be very happy to learn about the drugs which have very good oral bioavailability. Doxycycline, at, uh, antimicrobial belonging to the tetracycline class, also shares this property along with minocycline. Uh, clonidine, which is a blood pressure lowering agent, also shares this property of having 100% oral bioavailability. Although we are always very uh, perturbed with the oral viability being less because of first pass metabolism, but yes, there are some 
some drugs in our kitty with a 100% oral bioavailability. That is a good part, but the bad part is that oral absorption is impaired by divalent cations. How do these drugs come in contact with the divalent cations? They are through food because food contains calcium, through milk because milk contains calcium, antacids because they contain magnesium and aluminium. So if there is a divalent or trivalent cations, the, uh, the fluoroquinolones are going to bind with those and they are going to form a complex which will not be absorbed in the intestine. So this is a unwanted drug-drug interaction at the level of absorption and that is going to lead to therapeutic, a uh, sub-therapeutic effect. These drugs are widely distributed in body fluids. I told you it can reach the bone also and all the tissues of the body, except ofloxacin, which has a good penetrability across the blood-brain barrier. Very uh, other fluoroquinolones do not have a good passage across the blood-brain barrier. But yes, ofloxacin does have a good passage across the blood-brain barrier. And the half-life ranges from 3 to 10 hours. Longer half-lives are uh, seen for levofloxacin and moxifloxacin, but never to worry about the half-lives of these drugs because you know that I told you that they have a concentration-dependent killing, so you can give a large dose at one point of time, and the other part is that they have a long post-antibiotic effect, so even if the antimicrobial agent has been biodisposed of the body, its so MICs have fallen much below the MICs for bactericidal killing, uh, the killing action is going to happen. The dose adjustment is required in real and impairment, uh, except for these two drugs which are metabolized in the liver, pefloxacin and moxifloxacin, and there they will require dose modification in hepatic failure. Rest of the all fluoroquinolones will require dose modification in renal failure. This is the level of fluoroquinolones or ciprofloxacin when it is affected by something you have taken along with the food. Normally, you always ask whether to take this drug with food or without food. Your patients are going to ask it. Most of the drugs, you know, are preferred to be taken after food because uh, uh, the drugs are irritants to some extent. They might trigger some kind of nausea, etc. if it given an empty stomach because they directly come in contact with the gut, with the uh, stomach mucosa. So they are basically advised to be taken after food. But yes, for some drugs, uh, because they can uh, cause com form complexes with food or uh, they should not be given uh, along with food. So there we have levodopa whose uh, absorption gets affected if you are giving it by food because both levodopa as well as the proteins in the food or the amino acids in the food are going to compete for getting absorbed at the level of intestine. So levodopa should not be given uh, with food. It should be given empty stomach. Same for the thyroid supplements. They have to be given empty stomach. So there are few exceptions for some drugs which are given empty stomach. For all others, all other drugs need to be given with food. For that matter, tetracyclines also should not be given with food and fluoroquinolones also should not be given with food, especially the food which contains good amount of calcium. You yourself can appreciate in this figure that ciprofloxacin levels are maximum if it is taken with plain water and they decline substantially if it is taken with milk and they decline even further if it is taken with a thick curd which is called yogurt. So students, each and everything becomes important here. So the adverse effects, uh, students, I would uh, like to take in my uh, second session, which will begin with the adverse effects as well as the uses of these drugs and some unwanted drug-drug interactions with fluoroquinolones. Uh, for now, uh, I, I'm closing this session. Uh, please continue to read, and that is going to make us happier. That is going to even motivate us further to send the lectures. If you have any doubts and queries, kindly write in the comment section. Don't be afraid to put any comment. Any comment by the student is most welcome and most respected. Thank you so much, uh, students, and uh, please do this part nicely. And uh, yeah, when, you're, when you meet us uh, after a long time, uh, we would definitely be uh, having those uh, MCQs, which will be pending since long. And uh, yeah, the studies are going to start with full bloom. Thank you so much. Good night.